Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Sorry we're running a little bit late tonight. We were trying to dodge rain because we needed to go get a little bit of hay and get some feed. And um, somebody's out there shooting. <laughs> um, knock some things out and get some stuff done before uh, any rain came in. And we made it. Um, we were a little late getting out. And uh, so here we're here now. Um, this happens sometimes, guys, and then this this will happen sometimes because I'm helping take care of my mom's uh, little horse ranch. So it, there's times I have to leave and go do that. So, but I will never, never not film. If I have to, I'll pull over on the side of the road. So tonight we're going to read out of Psalm 119, 53, the biggest chapter in the Bible, the biggest chapter in Psalms, and sometimes bigger than many of the books in the Bible. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. <clears throat> In the New King James, it says, Indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Let's get some context. Start in verse 46. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. And I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. Remember the word to your servant, upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction. For your word has given me life. The proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I remembered your judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Why would he comfort himself about the old uh, judgments? Because he's not under them. He's not subject to them. See, he's he's very secretly, it seems to me like he's hinting at a future time when salvation would come. Indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. This has become mine because I kept your precepts. You are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep your words. See, that, that he's loosely, maybe not loosely, but he's kind of secretly under not underlying uh, speech here is he's talking about salvation. There's a lot of this stuff in, in the book of Psalms. I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your word. I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. So he's, he's talking about salvation. He's not talking about the law specifically. He's talking about salvation. He is talking about the law and the commandments. But the underlying reference there is salvation in Jesus Christ. My soul feelest thou this holy shuddering at the sins of others. Look at the world today. He's asking, do you feel this holy shuddering because of the sins, the wicked of the world? Look at the world today. Look at what they're doing. Look at how they treat the unborn. Look at how they treat everybody that does not align with their way of doing things. Look at how they treat them. For otherwise, thou lackest inward holiness. I feel it. It bugs me with the way people treat each other. I have a current situation I cannot officially discuss yet that we're trying to positively affect. That is such a situation. It bugs me to no end because it's not right. It shouldn't happen that way. And yet it's happening. Look at the world. Look at what they're doing. It should bug us. David's cheeks were wet with rivers of waters because of prevailing unholiness. Jeremiah desired eyes like fountains that he might lament the iniquities of Israel, and Lot was vexed with the conversation of the men of Sodom. We all know what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. Those upon whom the mark was set in Ezekiel's vision were those who sighed and cried for the abominations of Jerusalem. It cannot but grieve gracious souls to see what pains men take to go to hell. It's not just that they're denying God, it's that they're willingly going to hell and they're causing as much destruction as they can on their way there. They're doing a lot of damage on their way there. They know the evil of sin experimentally. 
and they are alarmed to see others flying like moths into its blaze. Sin makes the righteous shudder, because it violates a holy law, which it is to every man's highest interest to keep. It pulls down the pillars of the commonwealth. Sin in others horrifies a believer, because it puts him in mind of the baseness of his own heart. When he sees a transgressor, he cries with the saint mentioned by Bernard. He fell today, and I may fall tomorrow. Sin to a believer is horrible because it crucified the Savior. He sees in every iniquity the nails and spear. How can a saved soul behold that cursed kill? Christ, sin without abhorrence. How can a saved soul behold that cursed kill Christ without abhorrence? I don't think I said that right. But say, my heart, dost thou sensibly join in all this? It is an awful thing to insult God to his face. The good God deserves better treatment. The great God claims it. The just God will have it or repay his adversary to his face. An awakened heart trembles at the audacity of sin and stands alarmed at the contemplation of its punishment. How monstrous a thing is rebellion. How direful a doom is prepared for the ungodly. We talked about this yesterday. My soul never laugh at sin's fooleries, lest thou come to smile at sin itself. It is thine enemy and thy Lord's enemy. View it with detestation. In other words, hate what the Lord hates. He hates sin. For so only canst thou evidence the prophet, or sorry, the possession of holiness without which no man can see the Lord. We must hate what God hates. We all used to be there. We all used to be these sinners. And there's a great deal of warnings in the Bible about engaging in these types of sins, sins of the world. Warnings to believers. He doesn't warn the unbeliever. He warns the unbeliever to get saved. Flee from hell. You need to be saved. He warns the believer, flee from sin. Flee from these things. Now, can we be sinless? No. And the Lord deals with us in that with his grace and mercy with justification and sanctification. But we are to flee sin, especially when we know it's sin. The problem today is a lot of people don't. And they take what is sin and make it not sin so that they can keep doing it and justify themselves. What happens to people like that in the Bible? When they attempt to justify themselves. It is God who justifies. And so we have to examine ourselves and make sure that we're not doing that. That's not part of our course. It's not part of what's being a Christian is to justify sin. We can't. We must stand our ground on what we know to be true. Now, there are certain circumstances <laughs> where a different approach can be taken. But most of the time, no, I cannot do that. And I cannot be here while you do that. Especially when it's them literally thumbing their nose at God. It's almost like they're standing there doing it, and they're like, look at me, God. Look, look, I'm doing it. You ain't going to do nothing about it. Oh, what a day it will be. When the sheer terror of the reality of the truth of God sweeps around the entire earth. And all those people, some of them claim to be believers, by the way. A great many of them do. When all those people realize the reality of their state and their position. Many, many will repent. Many will turn. Many more won't. Every indicator I get from Scripture tells me that in the tribulation, everybody knows what's happening. They know exactly what's happening to them, and they know why it's happening. There, no, Nobody is in question. They know. Revelation 6 and the sixth seal fall on us and want the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the face of the Lamb for the day of his wrath has come. They know it's tribulation. They know it's time. Partway through the tribulation, there's a group of people, they, they wouldn't repent of their murders and sorceries, and instead they curse the citizens of heaven. They cur curse us and curse God. Why would they do that? unless maybe they knew exactly what was happening and why it was happening. 
And then the end of the tribulation, all eyes will see Jesus coming on the clouds of heaven. How do they know it's Jesus? Well, because they already knew what was happening. And they look and they see him like, well, there he is. And it says every tribe will tremble. Why are they trembling? Because they know final judgment is coming. They know he's going to stand on the earth. And we will be standing there with him. And he is going to enact final judgment. They know what they're doing. There are some. There are some who are unawares. There are some who don't know. But I think at this point in time, I think most people are most people are, are on the same page. They know what's happening. They know what they're doing. Some are joining in with the evil ones out of fear. They want to fit in. Or they're scared to stand their ground. And some just flat out, that's what they want to do. They want to be evil. They want to be separated from God. They think it's funny. But we don't. And we never will. God hates sin. We hate it too. We especially hate it in ourselves. Uh, it, it would be an incredible day when we come to that point where we don't ha have sin anymore. Where we can actually be sinless. And that is the day of redemption. When that heaviness will not wear on us anymore. When that corruption will not break our bodies down anymore. But the rest of the world, they're standing under the fountain fountain of evil, the fountain all that sludge and that mud and that corruption, and they're standing under it looking up with their mouth open guzzling every bit of it they can they, they, they go out of their way to sin is it no wonder God is going to come back and deal with it, is it no wonder he's going to say, I'm done that's it I'm tired of hearing all these children's blood cry out of the earth to me for justice I'm tired of hearing all these people that have been martyred for the gospel under my throne telling me, when, Lord, when? When will you serve justice on them? I'm tired of all these angels saying, Lord, when are we going to get rid of Satan and his boys? We're tired of them coming up here. We're tired of them blaming everybody. We're tired of them accusing. We're tired of them. When are you going to stop it? I picture God and Jesus sitting on the throne and, and all these people are complaining, all these entities are complaining. And the Father is sitting there and the Father is acknowledging them. Patience, when the time is right. And then when the time comes, Jesus turns his head and looks at God and God looks at him and says, go. And instantaneously he's gone. As a matter of fact, the Bible says God's coming too. Everybody's coming. <laughs> Everybody's coming. If you're affected the way this talks about, you're not alone. Some of us do a pretty good job of hiding it. We, we know what it is. We've experienced it. We've been saved from it. And we know that this is part of life. And so we bury it down and cover it. Um, but we don't ignore it. But we've become accustomed to what it looks like. It's still horrible. And it still horrifies us. But there's other things that need to be done. So we can't just shut down because of it. We hate it. Hopefully, as much as God hates it. And we hate watching the world do it. Look at what they're doing. This election has been off the chain. Such a weird year. And they, they blatantly lie. They blatantly deceive. And everyone just laughs. Ha <laughs> ha. Did you hear what they said? That's so funny. Did you hear what they're going to do? We must hate the things God hates. We must hate sin also. In ourselves, in the world, anywhere. I've gotten a little stronger at holding it in. But my anger shows sometimes when sin is directly in front of me, when sin is showing itself for what it is. 
my anger comes out. It's a righteous anger. And I show it. There's a particular situation I'm paying attention to right now where I have voiced my dispro disapproval of it. If I am brought into this situation, I'm not going to be able to keep my hands to myself. Because what's going on is there's no excuse for it. It's completely unwarranted. Um, that's how much I hate sin. I would beat my own self up if I could because of my sin, because I hate my sin and myself too. But this is the part of being a Christian. And the longer we go and the older we get and the more experienced we become, the more we become like those people that sigh. They were sighing for the previous days, for the old days. What are we sighing for? For the new days. For the days to come when there is no more sin. The days to come when there is no more temptation. For the days to come when the Lord reigns supreme on this earth with a rod of iron. God must pour his wrath out. He's been saving it for a long time. He must pour it out. It must be done. And he will pour it out on sin wherever he finds it. And what a glorious day it will be when, when justice is truly served, when truth reigns supreme, when right is actually right. Not what they call right nowadays. They make wrong, right, and right, wrong. May we all hate sin as much as you hate it, Lord. Even though we still do it, even though we still struggle with it, even though we still have problems with it, Lord, take us, take these temptations from us. Remove us or remove the sin from us as far as possible, as much as possible. But may we hate it as much as you do. Wherever we see it, within ourselves or others, may we hate it. And may we learn to make the distinction on how to deal with it. Some with a true hatred, some with the compassion of trying to help another come out of it. And some just avoiding altogether. Whatever needs to be done, Lord, may we do that. However it needs to be addressed, may we do it that way. May we do it according to your example. You addressed it in many different ways. One of them was to make a whip of cords and to go beat up on a bunch of people and run them out of the temple and flip over the tables yelling and hollering sometimes that's the kind of anger it takes sometimes it's a great deal of peace peacefulness and compassion sometimes it's directness and bluntness sometimes it's just out and out insult telling them exactly what the truth is in the rawest way possible be that as it may lord may we be able to tell the difference and may we be able to do it may we be bold enough to speak the truth because in doing those things we love them that much more because we love them enough to tell them the truth. We love them enough to warn them. We love them enough to say, hey, that's sin. You need to avoid that. Lord, may we be your people. May you be our God. And may we glorify you every day. We're not going to do it perfectly. I'm not even going to pretend that that's even a possibility right now. But Lord, may we get better and better and better and more and more and more like you every day and how we address things and what we do and how we live for your glory and in your beloved name amen guys thank you for joining me for evening devotion the reality of this is is that there's some dark stuff we have to deal with we're, we're living in a world full of it right now there's some things we have to deal with personally Sometimes at home and others, sometimes in ourselves. There's, there's always something we have to deal with. That's the way this life is. But there is a day coming when this will no longer be an issue. There's a day coming when all of this will disappear for us. We have to hold on until then. We have to overcome. We have to endure to the end. Because it'll all be worth it. It'll all be worth it when he stands on the earth and we stand with him. Stay strong, my brothers and sisters. Stay focused. Keep praying. Keep reading your Bibles. Pray for our leaders. This election has really gotten strange. Pray for our leaders. Because we need a change right now. Really bad one. And I certainly hope we get it. I'm convinced it's going to happen. But I'm still going to pray over that the Lord will make sure that 
Trump wins. He may not be the perfect guy for the job, but right now he's the best guy for the job because we don't want the alternative. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.